me share my screen, I'm sorry. Let's see. <sighs> Which one of my desktops? It's always, okay, I think it's this one, yeah. Okay, share. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our monthly meeting. It's February. Whoops. I'm sorry to keep doing that. Uh, it's hopefully you're all enjoying the cooler weather we're having. Uh, I know it was windy today, so it wasn't the best birding day, particularly to see the little guys, but hopefully you're getting out there and enjoying yourselves uh, in places where you can be safe. Uh, we have a wonderful program uh, this evening, as, um, and I think you're, you're really going to enjoy it. Um, so let's, let me continue on here. Uh, so for those of you new to Zoom, uh, remember to keep yourself unmuted. Uh, and so that's that little button is typically on the left bottom of your screen. Uh, if, if you unmute yourself by accident, it may disturb the presentations. So uh, Alan uh, Chin Lee, uh, who is administrating tonight, will probably mute you again. So please don't feel insulted uh, because we're just trying to have a really organized, organized presentations. So uh, some news and special announcements. Uh, February Kite, uh, I don't know if you've gotten the email yet. I, I know uh, Doreen uh, had to leave, go out of town and she's in charge of that. Uh, so you should be getting your uh, link for that very shortly. It is online, however, so you can go on the uh, Audubon Everglades website and see the wonderful, uh, robust kite we have this month. We have two brand new monthly feature articles. Uh, we now have a plant of the month, and this month's plant is the spotted bee balm. And Helen Lawrence, who is a master gardener, will be uh, writing those articles for us. So every month you'll be introduced to a new native plant that you can put in your yard or you can put it in a container pot and you can help attract uh, pollinators and birds to your, to your yard. Uh, we also have, we're also going to have a new series on uh, endangered and threatened birds in Florida. There are 31 of them currently. And Susan Davis, a former board member and, and master photographer, is, will be writing that series. So please look forward to that. She's going to introduce it. Uh, this month in her article, Our Vanishing Birds. Uh, our featured speaker tonight, of course, is Simon Thompson, uh, who I will introduce later, and I'm, you're going to really enjoy his, his presentation. Our bird of the month is the Atlantic Puffin, and of course, that's uh, uh, Clive and Cece will be presenting that this evening, and of course, the, both of those articles are also in the kite. Uh, we have a wonderful profile on Shelley Rosenberg, who heads our um, Purple Barton program. We have nine locations in the county where we have either installed Purple Martin housing or we are uh, helping another group install housing. But we are monitoring, help monitoring all those houses. So we are, we are helping that Purple Martin population in Palm Beach County. Uh, we have a eulogy to Roy Snyder who is a former board member, long, long time member of Audubon Everglades, uh, prominent advocate for conservation in Palm Beach County. Uh, unfortunately, Roy succumbed to uh, COVID um, and he is survived by his wife, Susan, who is a past president uh, and our hearts go out to, to her and their family. So there is a eulogy to Roy Snyder. Uh, I have written a president's corner. I am reintroducing that again. So that will be a monthly feature as well. And I will tell you about some of the goings on and uh, some of the things that you can expect. Uh, we have a call for kite writers again. We are hoping to continue to expand our, our kite, uh, continue to make it more robust. So if you like writing, if you want to work right for the kite, not work for the kite because we're not paying you. This is an all volunteer organization as all of you know. Um, please let us know. Um, there in the article, it gives you a contact information to our kite editor, and we will contact you and we'll get you involved. 
And Eagle Watch and Purple Martin Project are both going well. All our nests are covered. In fact, we have more volunteers than we even have nests. So many people are interested. Uh, the eagles are, uh, almost all the eagles have already have, have young, young chicks in the nest. Uh, so we're very, very excited. Uh, the Purple Martin Project is, uh, again, the Purple Martins are back. Uh, you may have seen them if you've seen some of the Purple Martin houses around the county. Wakota Hatchie has some, Peaceful Waters has some, um, Wellington Environmental Preserve has some. There are some on, on, on two fire stations in Wellington and they're in many other places as well. So they're back, go out and look for them. They're not all back yet, but they're, but they're coming back. Uh, the AU Photography Club has two activities coming up this month. Uh, one is a nature and zoology critique where, you, where uh, photography members will submit their images for critique on nature and subject of zoology. And there is a workshop on the 25th on learning how to use your camera settings, the limitations of your cameras and manual exposure. So you'll get to learn a lot about using your cameras on February 25th. Uh, some other announcements. The COVID vaccine, <laughs> which we were talking about in our chat earlier, uh, is available in Palm Beach counties. Hopefully some of you are getting it. If you haven't filled out the form, this is where you can get it. Uh, it is just uh, um, uh, http uh, dot dot uh, slash forward slash twice vaccine uh, uh, dot hcdpbc.org. You can take a picture of that if you want to. Uh, I'll leave that up for a moment. Our next AA meeting, uh, I mean, our next monthly meeting, sorry, is March 2nd. Um, and I will, and our presenter then is Dr. Rindy Anderson, who's coming back by popular demand. She presented last winter, if some of you remember, on why birds sing and why we study them. This is her area of research. And this is part two of, of her work. And I'm sure you'll enjoy it as much as we did last time. She's a great presenter and the, the research that she's doing is enlightening on the reasons that birds sing. Okay, field trips, nothing new to announce. They're still canceled through May 31st. Uh, we don't know when actually we'll be ready for in-person events yet. Uh, Palm Beach County, as some of you know, is still at level five for COVID. Um, so we are, of course, erring on the side of caution. We are concerned for your safety and we will continue to be until we get to kind of a new normal again. Uh, conservation updates. Today is Wetlands Day. Uh, Florida has the most wetlands in the contiguous uh, United States. We have over uh, uh, 10,000, 10, excuse me, 10 million acres of wetlands. We used to have 20. Unfortunately, the other 10 got developed. Uh, and then, and the other unfortunate thing that has happened to our wetlands, um, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has given over wetland um, um, uh, permitting to the Florida Department of the Environment, which is not a good thing uh, because we know that Florida is a development, a pro-development state. And hopefully the new administration, the new Biden administration, will rescind that uh, order, but we'll have to see. That's something we're gonna push for. On February 19th, uh, Phipps Park is planning to undergo restoration. The project sounds fantastic. They are looking for community feedback. If you have something you'd like to add to that discussion, uh, there is the address for the meeting, or you can go on the Palm Beach uh, Restoration uh, uh, Society's website and you can get that information as well. But they're planning to replant all of it, make it entirely native, bring back the birds, do some work in the mangroves across the street, uh, and including putting in a boardwalk there. It is really a wonderful project. Uh, the legislative session is coming up in March. On March 9th, we're hoping you can contact your uh, local uh, legislators and tell them to vote conservation. An easy way to do that is to go to the Florida Conservation Voters website and they make it very easy to take action. They have written letters that you can send in and you can make your voice heard. It's important that our representatives 
know that their constituents value conservation, conserving the land, conserving energy, etc. So please let them know. So uh, some volunteer activities. Uh, please join, if you'd like to join the Audubon Everglades Board of Directors as a corresponding secretary. This is the third time I'm announcing this. Whoops. We are still looking for this position. Uh, and again, you will be a, on the leadership board. Uh, you will uh, assist the president, that's me. And you'll be in charge of our correspondence with our members. We really need this position to be filled. We're looking for someone. If you have any interest at all, please contact me at info at audubonevergladesorg I am waiting desperately for your email. Uh, we also need a programs technical coordinator, someone who can work behind the scenes, not only now when we're in the COVID stage and using Zoom, but later on as well when we go back to in-person meetings. So if you are interested in that position, to help out with programs. Uh, that would help me out a lot too because I'm kind of doing that job as well right now. So uh, if you're interested, again, contact me at info at Everglades, audubonEverglades.org. So if you have questions tonight, put them in the chat, put them in at any time. You don't have to put them in at the end of when the speaker, after the speaker's presentation, you can put them in during. Uh, so it, it, and since I'm fielding the questions, it gives me a chance to go through the questions and try to order them and ask them in an order that I think works for the presenters. So we are at that wonderful moment where you are gonna get to see the bird of the month presented by Clive and Cece Pinnock. I can't wait. Clive, uh, share your screen. You are on. All right. Okay. Here we go. Take a second here. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> well, hi everybody. And uh, from CC and I, uh, it's great to be a part of this again. Uh, I generally like to just start out, especially since it's so early in the year, uh, mentioning here that our 2021 Bird of the Month series will focus on 12, now 11, uh, North American species requested by our Audubon Everglades members. And at each month, information on the featured species will cover uh, its description, range, habitat, food, and reproduction. All right, um, the bird of the month this month is the Atlantic Puffin, a really beautiful bird. And we wanna take a moment to thank Doreen for her recommendation or her request of this species. We've had um, several uh, members actually uh, request different species. And you guys are actually uh, helping to make the bird of the month for 2021 happen, and we're really excited about it. So thank you, Doreen, and the rest of you. We're intentionally doing this as a surprise each month so that those of you who requested won't know which month your bird is gonna come. So we're hoping that uh, you guys will have some fun with that. Um, first thing I wanna bring to your attention is the beauty of this bird. You will notice that um, the bird overall has a black and white pattern plumage, white, um, on the belly and the ventral area, and the black is on the dorsal side. The bird has an unusual look to it in that the head is kind of large in relation to the body. And one of the most striking physical features about the bird is its beak, that large triangular shaped beak that is also multicolored. As a matter of fact, it's multicoloring has caused the bird to sometimes be called a clown of the sea uh, because of those bright colors. As the bird matures and uh, gets into the breeding age, the colors actually heighten in intensity. And there's a variation of orange, yellow, uh, black, sometimes reddish uh, on the beak. 
And as the bird gets older, grooves are also added to the beak as well. What's interesting is that outside, <clears throat> excuse me, outside of the breeding season, the beak actually shrinks in size. So it's not as large as uh, during the breeding season. So during the non-breeding and throughout the winter season, the beak actually uh, diminishes in size for a little bit. The range of the bird is actually throughout the North Atlantic and uh, it extends anywhere from Canada uh, through Norway and even south into Spain. Um, we're getting uh, the pop, there's a, a growing population in uh, the United States and a lot of uh, travelers and visitors to the New England states like Maine and others, they're able to actually see breeding colonies uh, have not actually seen the bird, but Salisha and I are definitely looking forward to taking trips up north so that we can actually view the bird during the nesting season. Um, uh, the birds uh, actually do form uh, permanent pair bonds and so they're considered monogamous um, and uh, they uh, begin breeding at about age of five, anywhere between three to six uh, years of age, but on average, about five. Uh, once the male and female um, uh, get together, males generally will attract females uh, through a, a short courtship ritual where they bob the head up and down, lifting the beak uh, towards the sky and actually making a pig-like grunting sound, which apparently excites the female quite a bit and will attract uh, a potential mate. Once that pair bond is established, the birds actually keep the same pair bonding uh, year after year. I should mention here too that um, Atlantic puffins are quite long lived. The record is about 40 years of age. Uh, they live on average 30 or more. And uh, as I mentioned, 41 years, but uh, ornithologists actually speculate that uh, these birds do live a lot longer than 41 years. One of the challenges uh, in determining just uh, how old they get is having banding uh, material that can actually last as long. And of course, the banding material that's being used now uh, far exceeds what they used to have years ago. So we should be able to, with current research, be able to determine the longevity of these birds. One of the interesting things that you'll notice in these photographs here, and even whenever you see the birds uh, on television, or if you're fortunate enough to see them in the wild, you notice that um, they're able to hold a lot of uh, fish, which are their, uh, their primary diet. Uh, they're able to hold up to as many as a dozen fish in their beaks. And uh, what these guys will do is actually get out in the ocean. They will dive to, they uh, generally forage uh, during the summer months, anywhere from uh, surface down to 50 feet, but they have actually been known to dive as deep as 200 feet in pursuit of their prey. Their diet is made up predominantly of uh, sprat, herring, um, sand eels, many different species of fish, but they will also feed on crustaceans um, like copepods and shrimp, mollusks and marine worms. So they have quite a varied diet. Um, when they do collect these fish, however, unfortunately they are challenged by many different species of birds like the herring gull that you see there uh, at the top photo, squaws and um, uh, Jaegers are just some of the species of birds that will harass these little puffins to uh, uh, take their fish away from them. Uh, some of these uh, uh, guys will actually um, drive the puffin to the ground uh, in submission in order to get uh, the fish from them. Of course, these uh, guys that, these birds that are harassing them can fish for themselves, but quite often, just like our uh, um, uh, bald eagles will harass 
uh, ospreys to get the fish from them and frigate birds will harass others to get the fish. Um, these herring gulls, the Jaegers and the scores actually do the very same thing to the little puffins. You noticed, if you remember back when we looked at the, um, uh, even now in looking at the wings of the puffin, they fly frantically uh, using these short straight wings to get themselves through the air. But as they uh, pursue fish underwater, these wonderful wings become great propellers in uh, uh, gracefully getting these birds through the water uh, to capture the fish. They are actually able to um, capture as many fish as they do because they typically focus on bait balls. Bait balls are massive schools or shoals of uh, bait fish that swim in large circles and it actually makes it uh, a little easier for uh, the puffins to collect them. Now on the breeding grounds, they generally nest on uh, sea cliffs, uh, very ragged cliffs, rocky cliffs, um, on uh, sparsely vegetated islands as well uh, on the North, along the North Atlantic. Uh, they will actually use um, burrows if they can, if uh, loose sediment is available to them. That bird in the middle on the left is actually in a nest burrow. Uh, both male and female will actually work together to make these burrows, but they'll also take advantage of areas in uh, uh, crevices in the rocks, like the photograph on the far, the middle right. Uh, they will utilize these rock crevices. They will dig out uh, loose um, uh, sand and material under rocks as well. So. There's a little bit of variation. Uh, they line, typically line the nests with uh, uh, grasses, feathers, uh, twigs of that sort. One egg is laid by the female, but the egg is incubated by both adults for about uh, 36 to 45 days. Uh, the eggs have hatched. The young are brought uh, the fish Initially, the parents will place the fish directly in the beak of the young, but generally as the young start to grow and mature, the parents will actually drop the fish on the ground, enabling or forcing the young to feed themselves. These young are considered altricial uh, in their uh, uh, birth status. As you'll see in the lower left-hand corner, uh, they hatch with uh, uh, dark gray downy feathers. And again, they are cared for by both adults. Uh, after they uh, leave the nest, they actually generally leave the nest cliff at night and they head out uh, from the heights of these uh, rock crevices straight down to the ocean. And they spend the uh, next five years or so out at sea um, before they become sexually mature and return to um, potential next nest uh, cliffs and sites like that. Um, uh, here is a bird in flight. And um, uh, again, just drawing attention to the beautiful uh, beak and uh, the short wings and the pattern of the bird. I just wanna take another couple of seconds to read to you some information that I got, I found quite interesting. And I believe that you will too, in regards to the conservation of the species. It says here, major declines during the 19th century uh, were owed to the over harvesting of eggs and adults. During the 20th century, the populations continued to decrease at the Southern end of the breeding range in both North America and Europe. Populations remained vulnerable due to the introduction of predators such as rats on the nesting islands. An ambitious Audubon project, we, we all need to be very proud of this, an ambitious Audubon project to reintroduce puffins on former nesting islands off Maine started in the 1970s and has been a major uh, success. However, at the southernmost colonies, puffins have poor breeding success in warm water years, which are becoming more frequent as the climate heats. Atlantic puffins still number in the millions, but 
their numbers are declining mainly because of changes to their food supply from warming of ocean waters. The fish that make up the bulk of the puffins diet are actually cold water species. So obviously if the, uh, due to climate change, if our oceans are getting warmer, there's a, a significant decrease in the fish that are available to the puffins, which is going to have a direct impact on the puffin population as well. Okay, so Scott, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Can't hear you. Okay, you think I'd, I'd uh, learned by now. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so thank you, Clive. That was wonderful as always. Uh, so question time. We have a couple of questions. Uh, if anyone has any more questions, uh, please put them in the chat area. Uh, this is an interesting question, Clive. Uh, so, and before we get into specifics about the puffin, there's a question of asking, can you tell us about your birding background, your birding training? I started birding before I knew what the word birding meant. I was that attracted to birds. Um, I grew up in the islands, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in Jamaica, and uh, I was so captivated by birds that even in going to the library, um, I learned British birds because that was what was available to me at the library. I learned to identify British birds before I started to recognize the birds that were native to Jamaica, which is where I grew up. But I have always been fascinated by birds, wildlife in general, but birds in particular. And uh, I'm addicted to birds and to bird watching and uh, I was fortunate to uh, have made a career out of it, having worked uh, with the National Park Service as a wildlife biologist. Great, thank you, Clive. Uh, yeah, you're, that, that is a great life. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes. Uh, so some other questions okay. are more specific. Uh, 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 Blue Kaufman asks, <laughs> I've heard that puffins, that the puffin beaks react to UV light. Is that true? Oh, I think Clive is frozen or he's stuck. Reacts back. to light? UV. Yeah, so oh, UV, UV light. light. UV light. Uh, I am not aware of that in the research that I did. Yeah, in the research. I'm sorry, did you say UV light? Yes, yes, Clive. Scott, so, did you say UV light? Yeah, Clive, I said UV light. I, I think you're-, you're Oh, okay. You're um, I am not aware of that particular uh, uh, issue. Uh, in all <laughs> information. Okay, uh, un unfortunately, Clive, I think you broke up while you were speaking. Um, could you repeat okay. what you just said? about the UV light. I think you indicated that you're not, you weren't sure that you weren't familiar with the, if there was, if that, of that kind of research in that area uh, or- That's I correct. Okay. That's correct. In the, in the research that I did, nothing was mentioned about that in particular. So I'm not familiar with, uh, with that impact on the bird's bees. Okay. Uh, another question we have is, do the chicks return to the area where they were born. Do the puffin chicks return to the area where they were born? Generally, they do um, uh, to the general vicinity. Uh, some will return to the actual cliff location, uh, but sometimes if there is population pressure, they will seek other areas. Now, keep in mind that they not only will nest on coastal cliffs, but they also choose from time to time to nest on sparsely vegetated islands as well. So if the cliff uh, area is uh, full, that forces them to expand their, their nesting uh, forays. Okay, and I, 
think, oh, there's, I think that's all the uh, questions that we have. Uh, uh, there's a thank you. We are constantly impressed by your wealth of knowledge, by the way, as, as we've been thank for you. a long time. Um, and um, Blue, who asked the question about the UV light and the puffin beaks, uh, has actually provided a link. I guess she was researching it as you were speaking. So, okay. uh, and so that's great. So if somebody All wants right. to, that, that link is in the chat. If you're interested in learning more, okay. uh, go to the chat and just press on that link. Thank you so much, Claude. That was, that was wonderful. All right, let me just Thank you. Uh, uh, show my screen. And we'll look forward to the surprise bird of next month. We, are, we cannot wait. This is kind of like, almost like, uh, what's the next bird? Uh, so that's exciting. <laughs> that's really exciting. All right, so uh, let me. Let me just share my screen. And get back to my presentation. Okay. All right, so um, so we have our feature program coming up with Simon Thompson. And by the way, I, uh, in the um, in the advertisement or the the uh, email you got regarding the uh, presentation, it said North America. It should be Western North Carolina in Europe. So it's really the Atlantic Flyway uh, that you'll be hearing more about today, which of course we're all interested in. I don't know when the next time any one of us will be getting to Europe, but I am interested in that too. Uh, but before we do that. I have a quick poll I thought that we would do, and, it, and I think it will also inform Simon about some of our, some of our members. So uh, I'm gonna launch the poll and please fill it out. So um, quick question, it's, world bird, world, it's about world birding. Uh, where have you birded in the world? Choose all that apply. I see the Caribbean and Central and South America are popular spots. Europe also, it's more than 25% of you have birded there as well. That's wonderful. 15% Africa. Whoops, sorry, I did not mean to do that. Playing with the, uh, great. I'll leave it on for another 15 seconds. I'll give you all a chance to respond and get through it. Almost everyone is birded in Florida. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> North America, so most of you are birded outside Florida, 82% currently. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. All right, so I'm gonna share the results with all of you. All right, these are the results. 96% uh, of you birded in Florida. That means you're getting out there. I'm, I'm proud of you and you know, I try to get out there too. North America, so 82% of you have birded outside of Florida, somewhere else uh, in the United States or Canada. 40% uh, got down to the Caribbean, the bird. That's wonderful. Unfortunately, when I was down in the Caribbean, I wasn't a birder yet. So, but one day I hope to get back and be able to bird in that area. Uh, Central and South America, 34%. I've never gotten down there. I look forward to doing that one day, hopefully. Europe, 36%. Uh, Africa, 20% have gotten to, into Africa to bird. Asia, 8%. And Australia, 10%. 14% uh, said they birded others. Let's look in the chat and see if we can find out where some of those people may have birded. Uh, let's see, where is the chat? Uh, I can't find it on my screen right now. Okay, uh, let's see. Iceland. Iceland, uh, thank you. New Zealand. Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. And Panama. And Panama, wonderful, wonderful. Some great places to bird. Okay, so let me... Uh, Click on that again. I'm going to stop sharing the results of that. So, uh, uh, Simon, you now have a sense of where where we've been, <laughs> which is great. Okay. Very good. I'm All right. So, I'm, I'd like to introduce our featured uh, program for tonight. Our featured speaker, 
uh, is Simon Thompson. Many of us consider ourselves birders, but Simon Thompson takes birding to another level. He will cross borders and countries in search of rarities and ranks 34 of all eBird world listers. He has seen uh, 6,434 species. He might add a couple today for us uh, of the approximate 10,000 bird species in the world. He has also successfully completed the 365 day bird a day challenge, which requires birders to see a new bird species each day. And he's done this on three separate occasions from 2015 to 2017. And in 2017, he was the only successful birder to do so. Pretty impressive. I think that it would be safe to say that Simon is not your average birder. Simon Thompson is also an ornithologist. So while he is able to enjoy the sounds, colors, and behaviors of living birds in the world that fascinate mere mortal birders like me, he also understands the excruciating details of what underlies these sounds, colors, and behaviors. Simon uses his extensive knowledge and his experience in the field to help others see some of the incredible birds that can be found throughout the world. Uh, he, instructs, he instructs at birding festivals and leads birding tours locally in his home state of North Carolina, across North America, and internationally to destinations like the Peruvian Amazon, Belize, the Galapagos, Greece, France, England, and Australia, and many other locations. Pretty much anywhere our wonderful birds can be found. His company, Venture Birding Tours, arranges birding and nature tours throughout the year, and they concentrate on all aspects of bird watching. His tours also usually connect with local guides for a fuller experience that often includes any noteworthy sites in the immediate area. Now, please feel free to extend your arms out a bit and applaud in your living rooms, bedrooms, kitchens, or wherever you are watching this Zoom cast from as Audubon Everglades welcomes Simon Thompson to present on bird migration in Western North Carolina and Europe. Simon, please feel free to share your screen as soon as you are ready. Okay. Uh, here we are. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everybody. Oh, my, my, my. You make me sound like an addict. Hmm. Maybe I am. Well, like all of you, we haven't been able to do a lot of traveling lately, have we? Um, I did say to somebody the other day, I went to Virginia. They said, well, that's just next door. I said, well, that's still traveling, you know. That's as much as we can do right now. But um, just to fill you in, obviously I'm not from North Carolina, but um, I actually grew up in Africa, different countries in Africa and the Middle East. So I spent a lot of years, actually my formative years, I look back and I go, gosh, that was really amazingly lucky. I, my parents would ask me, what do you want to do during school holidays? And I'd say, go on safari, what do you think? So I went on safari almost three times a year when I was a child, it was wonderful. So yes, I it utterly spoiled. And now I'm in Asheville, North Carolina where I've been for about 20 years. So what we're going to do tonight is I think we're just going to have fun. I think we're going to enjoy, well, some of the sights and sounds of Western North Carolina. I'm pretty sure that many of you have been here, as well as Florida, which I know that a lot of you, of course, have birded. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have birded up around Western North Carolina. Um, I've been in Asheville, as I said, for about 20 years, and Currently, as I look outside my window, we've got two inches of snow. The temperature is 27 degrees Fahrenheit with a wind chill of 22. Okay, yes, it's not New England, but this is supposed to be the South. My turkeys that come for, for their breakfast every day, just sitting around looking utterly dejected. 
they don't like the snow at all. So we're going to take a little trip around North Carolina and I, th and I, th and I th threw some European information in as well. So let's go. Got to, uh -huh. So a couple of intro slides. We're going to talk about North America to start with. And we all grew up basically knowing these four particular flyways that go down through North America into Central and South America. I believe the latest uh, knowledge is the fact that this is a lot more flexible than we actually know. So. You'll, we're not going to concentrate on flyaways, we're really going to concentrate on some of the more aspects of migration as we go south. So, North Carolina, we've got birds come through the Western Mountains, we've got birds coming through the Tennessee Valley, and we've got birds coming down the coast. Of course, a lot of this depends on weather. And so when we get predominantly westerlies, a lot more birds end up coming through our mountains that would necessarily go, be going up the Tennessee Valley. and that pretty well occurs across the whole state. So now we're going to get into the fun stuff. A lot of these pictures are taken by some of the folks that come on trips, and some of them are taken by me. And so there's a big mishmash of various people's pictures here. And I've tried to put in ones that pretty well are indicative of where we are. So when you talk about bird migration, I'm really not going to go into the really technical thing about magnetic fields and all that tonight. But what we're going to talk about really is just more of the geographical features and how the birds see and feel their way south. So yes, we live up here in the mountains. We do hawk watching. Therefore, we go up to a mountain ridge and the hawks and birds of prey, eagles, all tend to migrate down these mountain ridges during the daylight hours. When we go up in the morning, often first thing in the morning, you've got warblers, songbirds coming down those mountain ridges. Others tend to come through the rivers. The river, if the mountains tend to get a lot of bad weather. A few years ago, we had you know, a lot of fog and rain up in the mountains and the Bird migration wasn't so, well, you couldn't see it because the mountains were so terrible, but the birds all moved along the rivers and along the reservoirs throughout our area. So you end up with a lot of waterfowl and um, herons and things like that that follow the, mount the rivers through the mountains here. And of course, as well as mountain ridges and the rivers, you end up with the thick forests that we have here in the mountains. And I'm lucky to live, I've, I live in a fairly normal neighborhood. We've got two acres of forest around the house and within 10 minutes, I'm up in the Blue Ridge, on the Blue Ridge Parkway and up into the, into the mountains. So it's wonderful in the spring just to drive a couple of miles and you see all the warblers and, and buntings and tanagers all starting to arrive throughout the spring months. There are four basic types of migration. I'm not, some of these slides are going to have some text on them. I'm not going to sit here and read it all to you. I figure you're all adults and you can do a lot of the reading yourself. But we're going to talk about four different types of migration briefly. Eruptive, altitudinal, nomadic, and austral. We're not going to worry too much about austral because that really doesn't affect us here in the mountains. But eruptive is evening grosbeaks. And I don't think any have made it too far into Florida this year. In, I think it was November, maybe October, November, we were starting to see little his sightings of evening grosbeaks around the mountains. We thought we were going to get a big push. We've had some. We haven't had too many. There's a currently some feeders in Durham in the Piedmont of North Carolina that have quite a lot of grosbeaks. And I went up to out just outside Gatlinburg in Sevier County, Tennessee, a couple of weeks ago. And this one person had 80 evening grosbeaks at their feeder. It was you know, quite the sight and the sound, but this fall we've had 
lots of pine skins, lots of purple finches, red-breasted nuthatches, and a few evening grosbeaks. I call them industrial strength goldfinches. They are, if you get them at your feeder, you'd better buy stock in sunflower seeds because they will eat and eat. So eruptive migrants, pine siskins, and they don't usually arrive in ones and twos. They usually arrive in tens and fifties. So they all went through in, in I think it was November, October, November, we had huge numbers going south. So I guess they must have ended up in Florida because we don't have any at the moment, but probably by late February into March, they'll start coming back through the mountains on their way north. We do get a few pine siskins that actually nest up here in the mountains, but um, not very, not very, you see them most of the time, but nobody has really proven them to, to actually have nested. Nomadic migrants, they're the ones that sort of just wander around really in, in response to abundance of food, are things like waxwings. Well, even your regular old cedar waxwing will, is nomadic. They wander around, they look for food here, then they'll fly a bit, they'll wander and find food somewhere else. And bohemians are exactly the same, but of course, we don't get bohemian waxwings down here in the Carolinas, unfortunately. Okay, this is for you to read while I have a slug of water. The bottom line is almost every single day of the year, there's something going on. There's birds moving up mountains, down mountains, through the local lakes and rivers. So who migrates? Well, the bottom line is pretty well most birds. There are a few that hang around. I mean, I don't think pileated woodpeckers migrate. I think they pretty well stay where they're put, so to speak. But all many, many other bird families, cranes, cuckoos, tanagers, warblers, hummingbirds, they all migrate in response, of course, to food. Excuse me. If a bird, I think, could withstand cold weather and still get a good amount of food, it would do that. Such as the, some of the eruptive migrants that we just talked about a few seconds ago, like evening grosbeaks, they'll stay way north if there's plenty of food. If there isn't enough food and there's a shortage, they come south. So often cold weather isn't the big deal. It's the abundance or availability of food. So where do these birds go? Well, we all say, yes, our birds go to South America and Central America. Well, they're not really our birds, to be honest. They are Central and South American and Caribbean birds that decide to spend the summer up here. So they are really tropical birds. And if you think that we have one species of hummingbird here in the east, it's kind of pathetic, really. And if you go into the Caribbean, they have a couple of dozen. And if you go into Colombia, there's 200. That pretty well tells you where hummingbirds originated down into the, in the tropics. And we have one. So it's a tropical bird that comes up here spends the summer, breeds, and then heads back to Mexico or Central America or wherever it happens to go for the winter. And actually, I believe that Mexico and some parts of Northern Central America are the most important areas for most birds in the US and Canada. So and if you think that the land area of Mexico and Central America and the Caribbean, it's really not very much. And all those birds from the US and Canada have to cram into that little tiny area along with all of the native birds. So yes, a birding trip down to Central America in the winter, that's pretty good, you know, because you've got all the local birds and you've got all of the 
migrants coming in to spend the winter. So it's something that I've done quite a bit of over the years. And the nice thing is a lot of these places are so easy. It's so easy to bird some of the Caribbean islands. You can just wander around a resort or wherever you happen to be. And some of the birds like in Jamaica, like Clive was saying earlier, you can get black-throated blue warblers, which breed up here in the mountains of North Carolina, are so common. And they come onto your table in the, in the mornings and they look for spiders on the porch. They really, it really is wonderful to see these things down there. So most of these birds go south. Here are a few examples. American red starts. Of course, being a Brit, a red start, which you'll see, you'll see a real red start in a minute. This, which, the red start was named off by these, those early settlers. And red start actually means, in Old English, it means red tail. And that's that little flash of red in the tail. And so the early settlers saw these birds that they thought looked like red starts from Europe and called them red starts, even though they're not related. These are New World warblers and the others are chats and flycatchers and things like that. So most of, a lot of these warblers like red starts tend tend to head down to the tropics, places like Costa Rica, Panama, and the Caribbean. Our little ruby-throated hummingbird that we mentioned briefly a, a little while ago, they, I put some little maps in as well so you can see a few probably end up in South Florida, actually a few in North Carolina at the moment, down at the coast of, towards the Outer Banks, some people have got five and six ruby throats at their feeder right at the moment, so I guess some that decided not to go south. But they predominantly winter in Central America and usually in open forests rather than true rainforest. Here's another one that is a, a good bird up here in our mountains. And you can see the range of the Canada warbler. It sneaks down the Appalachians, migrates around the Gulf of Mexico and winters mainly Colombia, Venezuela, and down into the Andes of South America. The places up here in the high Blue Ridge, it's quite a common bird. And like most of these little warblers and any birds in the summer here, if you know their songs and their call notes, it makes them so much easier to find. Here's another one, Cerulean Warbler. They nest within about five miles of my house, not many of them, but we've got about 30 or 40 pairs, I believe, up here in the Southern Blue Ridge, just north of Asheville. The funny thing is, when I first saw them here, they were at a local gap in the mountains, not so far from my house. Within the last 10 years, their, their population has slipped from that area and has moved north along the Blue Ridge Parkway. So, I mean, I don't know if that is climate change. I don't know what it is. It's not really been well studied, but in, we cannot look for cerulean warblers at this elevation anymore. They've moved up in elevation within my lifetime of living here. So that's quite interesting. But um, the ceruleans, again, winter in mostly South America. It's, it was funny, a couple of years ago, I, was, I did a trip down to Ecuador and of course, Ecuador is full of all these wonderful tropical birds and tanagers and all sorts of great things. And we saw this flock coming through and in the middle of the flock was a male cerulean warbler. And it was exciting to see it, even though I see them in my garden sometimes, but just in the middle of this flock, there was something familiar. And that was a little male cerulean warbler. And you just go, oh, I hope he makes it back north again. You just want to wish him well on his journey up north. Here's another one, Blackburnian warbler. It's quite common up here in the mountains. You can see again the range sneaks down the Appalachians here, almost into um, northern Georgia. But up here in our mountains, the Blackburnian is, is relatively common. It's not easy to see because, of course, when the leaves come out from about the end of April, or through the rest of the year, you can hear them, but they are impossible to see because they're small and there are a lot of leaves. But again, this is another one of those ones that winters in Northern South America. 
We mentioned the black-throated blue in passing a few minutes ago. Winters in Jamaica, where it is probably one of the most abundant land birds. Yellow-billed cuckoos. This has been a great year for them. They've been all over the place. And always good to see one regardless, but they tend to migrate across through the islands, through Central America, and the majority of them tend to go to East and South America. So majority in Brazil, of course, because Brazil takes up most of East and South America. As well as all these little land birds, there are shorebirds that go through. And shorebird migration, of course, it's a big family of birds. Some breed here, some breed a little further north, and a lot of them breed way up in the Arctic. So some of these shorebirds make immense migrations of you know, tens of thousands of miles on their way to their wintering grounds. And I remember I did a trip, a family trip with my partner, my mother-in-law and a couple of friends from England. And we spent a month exploring Chile. And we went all the way to Tierra del Fuego in the very, very Southern tip of Chile. And there were piles of beds and white rump sandpipers at all these little lagoons. It was amazing to think that a few months earlier they'd been in the Canadian Arctic. And now they were in southern Patagonia, where they'll spend the winter. And the neat thing about these shorebirds, which I tell people, is if you think that the adult shorebirds will come south in July, August, early August, and the immature birds come later. So they're going south. They've never been there before. There's nobody showing them the way. They must have an inherent instinct map method to get to their wintering grounds. Some of us as humans, we get lost going to the grocery store. So I think birds have got us beat many times over. Okay, well, let's, we've done a little bit of North America. Let's I'm just, let's, I'm just gonna move that, there we go. That's a European or common red start at the bottom. You see, it sort of looks like a, an American red start, mm, sort of. I guess if you weren't a birder, you'd think it might be, might. But my family is from the east coast of England. That's that bump that sticks out. I don't know if I put my cursor up, you can see it about there. The bump about, an hour east of Cambridge on the Suffolk coast is where my family is from, my mother's family. My father's family is from Warwickshire and Worcestershire in the West Midlands. But um, most of the, this gives you a, a rough idea of uh, some of the European migratory songbird or migratory bird patterns. A lot coming down through Spain, where my, my brother lives in the south coast of Spain, so that's why go there as often as I can, because the migration is pretty darn good. Uh, others come through the islands, through the Mediterranean, and then of course through the Middle East on its way down to the various parts of Africa. Southern Europe, if you've never birded in Spain, Spain is, of course it has great food and pretty good wine. And the birding is probably the best in Europe. It's a wonderful place to go. And I'll tell you a quick little story. I went over in February this year and um, went to take my mom on a trip. My mom's going to be 90 this summer. She's in good shape. And we, we drove, took the ferry across the channel and we drove through Eastern France, all the way down through a little bit of Switzerland. And we drove down to the Southern tip of Spain where my brother and his wife live. We were, we'd birded a bit, we'd done some wine tasting. We were just having a sort of a mother-son thing. And we were sitting on my brother's porch, you know, we were watching the news. And next thing we know, Italy is going nuts with COVID. And we look at each other and we talk and we go, I think we need to get back to England. So we took three days and we barely stopped. It was three days of solid driving to do 1500 miles back to England. We did a little bit of birding on the way, but most of the time we were going through France and Spain as hotels were closing, as borders were closing. And 
I know some of you have been to France. It's a great place. Food is wonderful. The only food we had in France on our trip was a truck stop sandwich. It was, a, it's just dreadful to think that you're driving through France and that's all you can get. So anyway, and then I got stuck in England for two and a half months before I could make it back home here. Anyway, back to European birds. Some birds, of course, you're familiar with. Common swift, it's the big Europe, common European swift, tends to nest under the eaves of buildings. And this is a, a pub near my mum's house called the Fox. And um, they have swifts that nest under the, under the eaves and they go screaming into the night sky every evening. Most common swifts, it's found all across Eurasia. And the majority of them cross the Sahara Desert and winter in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. Crossing the Sahara Desert is very much like crossing a very large ocean. There is no food, they can't stop, and it's, of course, brutally hot. Here's another not so common European bird. This is the Eurasian dotrel. It's a shorebird. It's one of those funny shorebirds that when the female is brighter colored than the male. And I've only seen them up in the northern tip of Scotland. And they, of course, breed circumpolar all across the northern hemisphere, even a few in Alaska, where I believe they're on the tippy tops of some very remote western mountains. But then they cross Asia and southern Europe and all winter in tiny little pockets across northern Africa, probably in the mountains of Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria and places, places that we just don't get to see them. Here's another one. This is a spotted flycatcher. It's not very inspiring. It's just a little brown bird with some spots. It's unfortunately declined quite a lot in Britain and now it's, it's, it's quite uncommon. Although I remember seeing them in my mum's garden nesting on the, on the drain pipes or wherever and now they're, we hardly ever see them there. But it's still a common bird across most of Europe and again spends the winter in southern Africa. The photo at the bottom was, was taken in Kruger National Park in, in South Africa. And this is another, this is a, I always tell people the American warblers are wonderful. They're beautiful and brightly colored. And the European warblers are dull. They're brown and green, but they can sing. The American warblers can't. They make little buzzy notes and little lisping notes, but they cannot sing. The black cap here is gray and black. That's it, but it has a fantastic song. Normally, it's a common Eurasian bird. It goes and winters in Southern Africa, Western Southern Africa. But recently, maybe it's climate change. I don't fully know that a lot of black caps are spending the winter in Britain or from Germany, the German black caps, and some in Spain, and they're not bothering to go any further south. And what has been discovered by research is, is that the Black, the build of the black cap, I think it may be bill size and various other aspects of the bird are starting to change, even in the short length of time that we've been studying these birds. And they, they're saying it's speciation within our lifetime. I think that's probably maybe a little exaggerated, but it's interesting to see how birds are changing in response to climate and maybe other factors as well. And here's another one of birds, of course, that everybody's heard of, the cuckoo. Of course, it's the common cuckoo is, is the European one. It's a big gray bird, long, long wings. And those long wings tell you that that is a long distance migrant. And a lot of them, of course, will winter in Southern Africa. There's been some fun studies. They've been putting little radio transmitters on common cuckoos from Norfolk in England. And these birds just wander everywhere. They'll cross south, some will go to France, some will go to Italy, then they'll go north. And it seems like it's fairly random as to what these birds do. But it proves that basically a lot of what we know about migration is still very, very rusty. There's still a lot that we don't know. 
here's a little bit of more text for you to read while I have another, another drink of water. Okay. Uh, I did not take this picture. This is one I stole from the internet. I just thought it was too good not to share. Migration is perilous. We know that. I actually watched a plane, not this plane, I watched a plane hit a black kite when it was circling on an airport once in Africa. And you'd think that the kite would see this gigantic piece of metal hurtling towards it, but I guess it didn't. And it got hit and obviously it was killed. But um, of course, we know that planes hit birds often with not good consequences. And crossing oceans, as I mentioned, crossing the Sahara Desert, any of these habitats that are completely alien for species can create, you know, it's, it's a challenge for them. And of course, as you guys know in Florida, hurricanes can impact bird migration in a big way. I like to think that a lot of birds actually know that they're coming and won't migrate, but it's, I believe a hurricane hit Dauphin Island, Alabama a couple of years ago and a bunch of purple martins were roosting and well, I believe quite a few got killed, but populations can withstand this for the most part. I was putting some, as Scott was saying, he's an eBird junkie like a lot of us are now. I blame Cornell for this horrible addiction, but I was putting in some notes from a 1980, yeah, 1986, 87 trip to the Bahamas. I was with a bunch of non-birding friends and we spent, went on a, sh on a yacht from Florida to the Bahamas and the boat had some engine trouble and my friends were all trying to get it fixed. And I said, I'll see you later, I'm going birding. So I went into some pine woods on Grand Bahama and I saw some Bahama swallows and some olive cap warblers. And I saw a couple of brown headed nuthatches. Well, roll on to 2021 a couple of hurricanes hitting the Bahamas and apparently the brown-headed nuthatch or what some people call now the Bahama nuthatch is down to less than 10 birds. Mm. So mm, I'd forgotten that I had seen them, but I looked at my notebook and there it was, two brown-headed nuthatches seen in Grand Bahama near Freeport. So it's always good to keep notebooks and write the birds down that you see. A little bit more on hurricanes. We've often seen these hurricanes that sweep up the coast, usually walloping the outer banks of North Carolina where you couldn't pay me to live. But I'd go and visit and see some of the good birds, but I don't want to live there. But um, I remember a couple of hurricanes, I can't remember the names of them a few years ago, that swept up through the edge of the Carolinas, up through New England and dumped bunches of chimney swifts, yellow-billed cuckoos, and things like that up in the maritime provinces of Canada. Of course, a lot of these birds aren't in the best of shape and a lot won't make it, but you hope that, you know, a lot of birds will, they'll withstand this, they'll readjust, they'll realign, and hopefully they'll continue south. I like to think of birds as actually being a lot stronger than we give them credit for. I've seen some birds completely on the wrong side of the planet to where they're supposed to be. Here's a, a, fun, a fun picture. This is from the, um, one of these NOAA radars. And I, I'm sure we could all remember when the weather person used to say, ground clutter. 
and ground clutter, of course, we now know a lot of it is migrating birds. And this is an April day in Key West and birds are coming across from Florida on their way. Things, apparently somebody told me that was a lot of Perula warblers, Northern Perulas that tend to come at that time of the year across into, the, into Southern Florida. And as I mentioned, a lot of these birds have to cross quite inhospitable habitats on their way to and from their wintering and breeding grounds. And yeah, I saw an American red start in England, not where you would expect to see one. That year we had a rose-breasted grosbeak, a red-eyed vireo, a bobolink, a Baltimore oriole, all in England. Yes, they might survive the winter, but I don't think they'll ever make it back to this country. But if a bunch of them, and who knows, it may have gone across on a ship, I have no idea. To, to think that an American red star, which is a tiny little bird, can get across the Atlantic is quite something. And some years, you know, there are, there are several, there are, I believe spotted sandpipers, of course, they're the stronger birds. They've actually tried to nest in Scotland, so they've actually met up. So, but some of these larger birds like ring-billed gulls and spotted sandpipers, lesser yellow legs and things like that can easily survive an Atlantic crossing and will, maybe they won't get back, but they could end up colonizing a different part of the world. There's a little bit more text for you. A lot of that stuff I'm sure you probably know. Um, I remember, as I mentioned, I was on that Bahamas trip and I was looking at my field notebook. And I remember watching, being out in the middle of the Gulf Stream and seeing a sharp shinder hawk go past the mast of the boat, then a yellow-billed cuckoo, then a couple of rose-breasted grosbeaks. So it's amazing to think that these birds cross immense amounts of ocean on their way to their breeding grounds. As I mentioned, there are still problems. And this is something we're starting to do here in Asheville, even though we don't have a lot of big buildings, is to do collision surveys and maybe it take, get the lights turned off on buildings during peak migration. And one of my pet projects, I, I have to admit, I am a cat owner. I have two cats and they live very happily in my house. But I remember watching a cat at a neighbor's house take a rose-breasted grosbeak off the feeder. And I just thought, this is just not okay. But that's my soapbox and I'm not going to get on it tonight. But despite all of those problems with hurricanes, glass buildings, planes, bad weather, cats, you name it, See, these birds are quite strong and given them, give them some space, they will make it back from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds. This is the Blue Ridge here behind us, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and that little black and white warbler, which turns up at the very end of March. You can hear them in the still bare woodlands. And waiting for them, of course, all these crazy bird people and yes, there's nothing like just driving or walking along a trail here in the mountains and you can hear the first black and white warbler in the woods. And the nice thing about the mountains in the spring is in March, April, April, you've got until about the 20th of April and that's when the leaves start to come out. But those two weeks prior to that, the birds are back and there are no leaves, it's wonderful.
I've got more gray hair now. But as I mentioned, it's great to see these birds coming back. And when they go south the previous year, some of them like the scarlet tanagers are green and black. They come back sparkling red in their breeding colors. Indigo buntings are blue now. They're not brown when they go south with just little touches of blue. Chestnut sided warblers, which if you go down to Costa Rica in the winter, uh, you have to kick them out of the way. There are so many of them. But when they turn up in the spring, they're crisp and yellow and black and white and ginger. They're really smart. And every overlook along the Blue Ridge Parkway where the Park Service has done view enhancement is covered up with chestnut sided warblers. So they're apparently more common now than they were in Audubon's day. Other great birds that come back, golden winged warblers, yellow breasted chats. So just a few pictures at the very end. Let's say you want to come up to Western North Carolina and go birding. Well, there's lots of great places. Too many to mention tonight. The Blue Ridge Parkway. You can't go wrong. There's lots and lots of great birding anywhere you go. Lots of great forest. Up to Mount Mitchell, Red Cross Bills, Black Bill Cuckoos, all sorts of great things. Uh, even our own little Beaver Lake Bird Sanctuary here in Asheville. It's only seven acres, but we have breeding yellow-throated warblers and brown-headed nuthatches, green herons, yellow warbler, Baltimore Oriole, all sorts of things that, of course, that are sensible now and have gone south for the winter. If I was one, I wouldn't stay here. I should have gone south. Normally, I go south for the winter, but this year I'm marooned here in the snow. Jackson Park in Hendersonville, it's a city park. We've had every single Eastern Warbler in that park, including both the hybrids. This is Lawrence's Warbler, which is the recessive hybrid from Blue Wing and Golden Winged Warbler. So it's just, it's in the mud river, um, the French Broad River system. And so all these birds move along the rivers and sometimes the numbers can be immense. I remember one day seeing over 50 red starts in one morning. Lake Junaluska. If there are any Methodists amongst you, it's a Methodist camp up here in the mountains in Haywood County, great in the winter. We've even had pelicans on it in the past. So I was there the other day and there's loads of ducks there. Another great spot that I'm sure some of you have been to, Timney Rock Park. It's, of course, used to be a private, now it's a state park. It's, I went there by accident the first time I was invited and I thought, oh, it's just a tourist attraction. Well, it is a tourist attraction. So do not go on a holiday weekend, but worm-eating warblers are abundant in the park. They're all over the place. They nest on the trails. Orioles nest on the river. It really is a lovely place to go when it's not crammed with visitors. And one of my favorite places that you may or may not know one of the western, there are three counties in the west of North Carolina in the tip, Clay, Graham, and Cherokee. Graham County is where the film, um, I believe Nell was filmed in Graham County. So it's, it's got a little bit of a reputation, but over 70% of the county is national forest. So it is spectacular. Joyce Kilmer Forest, uh, there are trails that are level that you don't have to climb up and down mountains there's loads of warblers it's i go every spring i'm i go to a local lodge when i'm the bird person on staff and we do bird walks every day it's up at a place called snowbird lodge and that's wonderful every spring but as i said there are way too many spots to mention pick up the north carolina birding trail mountain trail guide that'll help you and there's Lots and lots of um, great places we put that together to help you find your way around this part of the world. And many thanks. These are some of the folks that took some of the photographs in the program tonight. Kevin, it's funny, Kevin, who's one of my guides, while I'm doing this presentation, he's just finishing his virtual tour of northern Minnesota. I think my program was a bit warmer. So, and there we are. Thanks guys, thanks for 
coming on a, on a little journey. And if you have any questions, I'll have to put Scott in charge of all that because that's way outside my zone of technological awareness. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon. That was a wonderful journey through uh, North Carolina and, and Europe and some great photos, some wonderful, wonderful photos. Uh, the, some questions are coming in. Uh, some of the ones I already have. Um, what are good birding spots near Charlotte, North Carolina? Charlotte. Well, funny thing is, I'm going to Charlotte next weekend. Um, there are lots. There are. There's another field. There's another one of those birding guides. I think it's the Piedmont. There are three mount. There are three birding trail guides to North Carolina. One on the coast, one in the Piedmont, and one in the mountains. Uh, Charlotte has actually lots of good greenways. It's got. A lot of, I would get on to, well, to be honest, the easiest way to find good birding spots is to know what county you're going into, hop onto eBird, click on the county region, pull up all the hotspots, and then look at the 10, 15 best hotspots and go to those. That's what I tend to do. If I'm going somewhere I don't know, is I go pop onto eBird, look at the hotspots, and then look at which ones I'm going to go to. That's by far the easiest way. Great advice, thank you. Um, so um, there aren't actually many questions. We're, uh, we're getting a lot of uh, thank yous. Uh, uh, one, uh, Chris Golia, who's one of our board members does SEG, okay. Beaver Lake is one of the best burning places I've ever been to in Asheville. Uh, the local Audubon Club maintains a beautiful lake in the mountains. Thank you, Chris. Yes, it's really nice. We One nice thing about it is completely, it's 100% accessible. It's a boardwalk that runs through the whole of the sanctuary. There are benches. You don't have to get your feet muddy. If you can't walk very well, there's a bench every so often to come and sit down on. So it's really, it's a very nice spot. It gets used quite heavily, but um, it still produces great birds over the, over the, certainly in the spring and the early summer. Okay, so here's, I'm gonna read off the thank yous. Uh, Robin Diaz, fabulous Simon, many thanks. Hi, thanks Robin. <laughs> Mary Dugan, thank you, loved it. Uh, Serena Rinker, thank you Simon. Uh, Jay Richard, great program. Vicky Rogerson, virtual hands clapping. Uh, Sheila Calderon, um, I'm not sure what, actually I don't see her, 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 her chat uh, comment. Nancy Freeman, thanks for the, a great presentation. Uh, Lillian, uh, thank you, Simon, fantastic presentation. Uh, Janice Faden, Fadden, sorry, very good presentation, thanks. Sheila Calderon, here she is. Thank you, Simon, absolutely great presentation. Hope you come back again soon. Uh, that's an invite. Uh, and Joanna Crilly, uh, many thanks, Simon. Uh, and by the way, Joanna is also from England. Oh, <laughs> I know it's funny, I, I go back to England, they say, oh, you sound like a Yank. <laughs> and I come over here, they say, you've kept your English accent, so I really don't know what I have, or <laughs> I feel like I'm stranded mid-Atlantic half the time. <laughs> That's great. Uh, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Joanne actually says, I am Irish and now oh. Canadian. She corrected me, I'm so <laughs> I apologize, Joanna. That's, yeah, great. Uh, that's okay. Actually, you know what, I think I've got, eight birds on my Irish list. Not very uh, good. I really need to actually set foot on. I, my partner and I, it was on his bucket list a couple of years ago, and I'm glad we did it pre-pandemic. We have went to London and took the boat, train down to Southampton and took the Queen Mary across to New York. And we I was doing my eBird lists as we left Southampton and across Southern England and out into the Atlantic, I was doing my eBird lists about every so many hours and I put them in. And next thing I know, I have an Irish bird list. I have to admit, I've never been to Ireland, but now I have eight birds courtesy of the Queen Mary going through Irish waters. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, all, no. all pelagic, that's great. Uh, Vicki Rogerson does have a question. She says, has Simon ever birded in Palm Beach County. She mentions Wakota Hatchie as, uh, well, of course, have, one of our- I've actually got one of my one of my guides, Emily Travis. Her parents live in Palm Beach County and she used to live in Asheville, now lives is taking care of her parents in Palm Beach. 
and I've been to Wakoda Hatchie and I've been to what's that other place that was so good for a while. Is it uh, Green K? Uh, Green K, yes. yes. What, what Loxahatchee, where you oh, used to go and see the uh, smooth build Annies when they were around. Yes, Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. And, I like that a lot. And in fact, uh, Serena Rinker, who was one of the people who said thank you, mm -hmm. to retired as a long time um, a range uh, uh, educator from, uh, from the refuge. It's Funny, when I first moved to this country, I remember I was fairly you know, broke and trying to be cheap. And I remember driving, doing a South Florida trip and we pulled into the parking lot at Loxahatchee or nearby late at night. And I thought, we're too cheap to get a hotel. And so we slept in the parking lot and you couldn't open the windows because as soon as you open the windows, the mosquitoes poured um, in. And I thought this was a very bad idea. <laughs> so we never did that again. Worse, worse than the Everglades. Uh, by the okay. way, uh, Emily Travis, who you mentioned, is now a naturalist at Okahili, Okahili Nature Center. Well, go and say hi. Well, well, I spoke to her a couple of days ago. So we, she's really good and very enthusiastic and right. just, and, just, and, super to be around. And Joanna Crilly mentions that puffing puffins and lapwings. I think she's mentioning she's mentioning Ireland, perhaps, uh, or Scott, or both of them. They're all, lapwings, or you know, is a type of plover like a like a sort of a fancy killdeer with a crest and a different color. But they're lovely, and they're found all over England. They're not doing well in the farmlands, but there are lots of them in the winter when they flock and move into the wetlands. There's lots of them. Well, I think I've gotten through all the questions and all the thank yous. I'm sure there's more uh, that people haven't mentioned. And I just want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. My uh, pleasure. Thoroughly. And I loved how you, during your water breaks, you allowed us to, you gave us this, these moments to educate ourselves. You're the first presenter to ever do that. I, really, <laughs> I love that strategy. So it, that, that was great. Well, thanks. It sort of gives me a breather. I don't have to memorize all these darn facts and I can have a drink of water or wine or whatever else I have with me just so can, I can relax a little bit. But no, thank you. Thank glad you enjoyed it. It's, it was wonderful. And I, and I hope we can have you back sometime, Simon. This was okay. great. Always happy. And, and if you're ever down in our area, please get in touch with us and we'll, we'll treat you well. Well, <laughs> I'm looking forward to being, I'm not 65 yet, I can't get a darn vaccine. As I said, I'm 30, over 30,000 people ahead of me, but as soon as I get it, I'm looking forward to actually traveling again. I haven't been on it. Normally I'm on a plane at least twice or three times a month, four times. I haven't been on a plane since last May. So when I came back from Europe, so like most of you, I'm sure we just want want this thing to be over and get back to normal again. Yes, yes, we all do. We all do. Yes. Well, thank you, Simon. Uh, thank have thank a great you. evening. And and we hopefully one day when I get up to North Carolina again, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, 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 I'll look you up and we'll go birdie. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm here. Well, I... Thank you, Simon. Have, okay. have a great evening. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. I'm just going to share my screen real quickly. Um, Stop sharing mine. Okay. There we are. You're all back. <laughs>